All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage, and my name is Eddie Watson. If this is your first time to the channel, then welcome. If not, welcome back. So in this lesson, we're going to continue along with some of the lessons that I've been doing here for a little while now on the subject of COVID-19. And specifically in this lesson, I want to talk about a, a new promising drug that's that's coming into a trial right now here in the United States, which has the potential to provide another option in treating these patients with COVID-19. And that medication is something that we call tocilizumab, and it also goes by the name Actemra. Now, tocilizumab is considered an immunopressive drug, and so it helps to regulate the immune system response. Now, to get a little bit more technical, this is actually a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody that's used against our interleukin-6 or our IL-6 receptors. Now, this IL-6 receptor is expressed on different immune cells such as monocytes, macrophages, uh, dendritic cells, and to some degree on our B and T cells. And the cytokine IL-6 is actually something that we refer to as pro-inflammatory. And so this means it's a cytokine that shifts the balance into a more inflamed state within our immune system. So this recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody, what the heck does that even mean? Essentially, we take the human IL-6 receptor and we inject it into an animal like a mouse. The mouse is then going to produce antibodies against this particular receptor, and it's on the end of these antibodies where it has the binding site to the IL-6 receptor. So then what we do is we essentially remove that specific binding site, and then we take a human antibody protein, and we attach those receptors to the end of that. And so what this does is it gives us a, a pretty natural antibody. I mean, obviously, we're not going to have antibodies against our own IL-6 receptors, so that part would not be normal here. But we have a, a protein that's, for the most part, recognized in the, the human body. And so as a result, we have pretty negligible immunogenic response to this, and it doesn't activate complement in response to this being in the body as well. So this medication's actually been around for a little while. It was developed by uh, Roche in combination with another pharmaceutical company. And it actually has several FDA-approved uses, uh, primarily for autoimmune disorders. This medication is used to treat RA, or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, as well as SJIA, which is systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, as well as some other more obscure autoimmune disorders. Interestingly enough, is it's actually approved for cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm as a result of CAR T cell therapy. And it's this particular use that kind of sparked the interest in wanting to look at this and possibly treating COVID-19. Now, the reason that it's beneficial in these disorders as well as the cytokine storm is it has an impact on, on a lot of things that are going on in response to the IL-6 cytokine. So we see uh, inhibiting and downregulating of CRP, fibrinogen, our ESR, our rheumatic factor, serum amyloid A, as well as others. But because of its impact on the immune system, it does have some contraindications, specifically with latent tuberculosis and acute infections. The last one there is a bit interesting because, well, with COVID-19, that's specifically what we would be using this medication for. So let's actually talk a little bit about how this medication works. So in our body, we actually see the IL-6 receptor as both a membrane-bound protein as well as a soluble protein. Now, what normally happens is, let's say, an IL-6 cytokine comes along and binds with the IL-6 receptor, is we actually have these other membrane-bound glycoproteins, something called GP130, to which the IL-6 receptor and the IL-6 cytokine are then going to bind to. And this is what propagates the downstream signal pathway of IL-6. So now if we have tocilizumab come in here and it then binds to the IL-6 receptor, that that's actually going to prevent the IL-6 cytokine from binding to it, thus preventing it from binding to those GP130s and propagating that signal pathway. So essentially, we're blocking that signal pathway from continuing what we would normally expect to see with the IL-6 activation. And one of the nice things about tocilizumab is that it actually works on both the membrane-bound and the soluble IL-6 receptors, unlike certain other medications within its class. 
All right, so with that information out of the way, let's talk more specifically about COVID-19 and the potential use of this medication. So one of the major issues with COVID-19 is this cytokine storm that we see. The cytokine storm plays a part in the development of ARDS in our patients. Now, IL-6 is thought to be a major player in the cytokine storm of COVID-19. We do see IL-6 levels correlating with the severity of disease. Now, if you want to understand this a little bit more, I'm going to link to a lesson up above here that specifically talks about the cytokine storm in COVID-19. So if you haven't watched that, I, I highly suggest you do in order to have a better understanding of why this might be important. But when we talk about tocilizumab, that this could potentially be a good candidate for reducing the pro-inflammatory response of the body's immune system here. Now, an important thing to know, though, because of this is it can prevent fevers from presenting. So if a secondary infection comes about, it may actually be hidden by the use of this medication. So why is it that people are showing interest in this? I actually want to talk real quickly about two different studies that have kind of pointed us in the right direction for giving some consideration to this medication. The first one here is titled Tocilizumab Treatment in COVID-19, a Single Center Experience. So this is one of the, the early studies that I found uh, specifically addressing this medication with COVID-19. And this was published uh, April 15th, 2020. And I believe it was in the Journal of Medical Virology. And it was a study, it was a, a retrospective observational study from a single hospital within Wuhan, China. So it was a really small study. It just looked at 15 patients who ended up receiving this as treatment. And one interesting thing that they noticed was that in all patients that were given this medication, they saw a significant drop in CRP levels, which were all high prior to the administration of tocilizumab. Of those 15 patients, though, three of them did end up dying. But from this small study, it appeared, though, as a second dose of tocilizumab may be beneficial in these patients. Now, from here, there were other studies that were done that I have come across, but the next real big one that really kind of showed a lot of promise was this study here. This one's titled Tocilizumab in Patients with Severe COVID-19, again, a retrospective cohort study. And this one was actually just recently published, June 24th, 2020. Now, again, this was a retrospective observational cohort study that was actually done uh, across a few different centers in Italy. And essentially, in these facilities, they were giving patients a standard of care that consisted of oxygen, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, uh, antiretrovirals, as well as low molecular weight heparin. But a subset of these patients did receive tocilizumab. In the time when they went back and looked for this observational study, they had 1,351 patients who were admitted. Of those, 544 were found to have severe pneumonia and included in the study. And of that 554, 179 were given tocilizumab, and 365 were in the standard care. Now, due to shortages that they had with the IV tocilizumab, some patients were, were actually given subcutaneous doses, which we can actually see that breakdown here when we take a look at the results of this study. But like I said, of those 179 patients, 91 were given the subcutaneous form of the drug, and 88 were given the IV infusion. So a couple interesting things when we look at the, the data and the results here. Some of our baseline characteristics were pretty similar. Specifically when we look at the age, 64 versus 69, as well as our sex breakdowns here. Here we had 29 and 71 versus 36 and 64, both pretty similar. But some of our big differences were, if we take a look at the duration of symptoms here, we can see that in the tocilizumab group that they had seven days of symptoms versus five days in the standard care group. They also had a higher SOFA score, three versus two, but probably most significantly is the PF ratio. Here in the tocilizumab group, we had an average of 169 versus 277 in the standard care group. So kind of based on our PF ratio, our SOFA score, the duration of symptoms, I think it's pretty fair to say that the tocilizumab group was actually a sicker group than the standard of care group. And that kind of makes the results that we see here even more interesting. Now, if we look at the, the outcomes here, the number of patients that received mechanical ventilation, we had 18% versus 16%, so it really wasn't significant. Uh, even the, the deaths after they were given mechanical ventilation, we had 15% versus 25%, but again, it wasn't statistically significant. But what's really interesting here is we look at the, the overall deaths, the patients that were given tocilizumab, we had only 7% who died versus 20% in the standard care group. 
So that actually was a pretty significant difference that we saw here. And this really got us thinking that patients who received tocilizumab showed significant reduction in death, uh, including those who were intubated, although those weren't necessarily statistically significant. Now, again, some of the, the disadvantages of the study is it was a retrospective study, observational study. It wasn't a randomized control trial. But based on the, the outcomes that we see here, it definitely makes us want to study this more. And this is actually something that's been going on. So we've had phase one and phase two trials where this drug did show promise in vitro. And just recently, they were approved for phase three testing in order to try to get FDA approval for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. So I know that's something that, that's going on on a global scale right now, that there's these randomized control trials taking place, uh, including at our facility coming up here. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the outcomes of this potentially promising medication are. Like anything else, though, we have to base this off of solid evidence and a randomized control trial, which I believe this one's also double blinded, is the gold standard for being able to determine that. So finally, I just wanted to hit on real quickly the, the dosing that we seem to see when, when using this medication for COVID-19. And it seems to be the common doses that we're giving 8 milligrams per kilogram of body weight up to 800 milligrams, and then following that first dose up with a second dose 12 to 24 hours later. And then finally, to cover some of the, the side effects that we see with this medication, some of the, the common ones are things like runny nose, sore throat, sinus pain, as well as the common cold, headache and dizziness. We can also see hypertension as well as upper respiratory tract infections, as well as we can see transaminitis, uh, specifically elevated ASTs, as well as possibly elevated cholesterol levels. And in rare cases, specifically when patients have taken this medication uh, continuously for some of these autoimmune disorders, that we have seen GI perforation. So these are just some of the things to, to keep an eye on if you do find yourself in a situation where you are giving this medication. All right, hopefully this was a good overall review of this medication, uh, as well as kind of covering you know, how it works, as well as some of the reasons that it, it might actually be beneficial in the treatment of our patients with COVID-19. I really hope you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, make sure and hit that, that like button. It really goes a long way to help support this channel. As well as if you haven't already, I, I invite you to subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out on a new lesson being released. As well as a special shout out to the awesome Patreon supporters out there. I really appreciate the support that you guys offer. Uh, as well as the additional content that you guys have access to as a result of that. Uh, if you'd be interested in supporting this channel even more, feel free to head on over to the, the Patreon page and, and check out some of the things that we have there. In the meantime, though, make sure you guys check out a couple of the other awesome videos I made right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.